Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Hoda, and I was cut when I was seven years old. And we were from the city, so I call myself lucky. And even though we were cut at home, we had a local anesthetic. Um, for us, it was something that we were getting ready for. We, we go to school, children ask you, have you been cut? Have you had the procedure yet? And it's a procedure you look forward to. Um, when the day before we were cut, we had a big party. It was a celebration. We had henna, we had a lot of popcorn and sweets and stuff, and we were very excited. I remember that morning, the morning of the cutting, waking up, and I woke up so early, I couldn't sleep because I was so excited. And the cutter came and she said, you know, she explained, and it was me and my younger sister. So always the younger ones goes, goes first. So she told me that my younger sister's gonna be going first, I have to be strong for her. And I need to make sure I'm not crying, I'm not screaming. And at the age of seven, I have to become a woman for my sister. The procedure happened, and as you can see this film and all the other films that we did, like The Cruel Cut, every woman's story is different. I did not feel when I was being cut, but I felt the needle of the anesthetic going in. That is the pain I experienced when the procedure was happening. For me, the pain started when the woman left, and that was the anesthetic walk coming out of my system just worn out and it was painful and I remember being feeling like I was burning and but at the same time I was told the pain is normal so again I have to be a woman and be strong at the age of seven everything went well when a year after the civil war started in my country so we have to leave we were from North Somalia and we went to the capital of Somalia in, and in Mogadishu. So when we got there, two years after we got there, I remember the civil war started there as well, but the week before that, week after the civil war started, I started getting pains and it was only nighttime. I was in pain and I didn't know why I was in pain. So I always ran to my parents' room and mom and dad just put me in the middle of the bed and I'd fall asleep. And it was like that for a week, but then it got worse. But this time, there was no hospitals. There was civil war, everybody was trying to come out, get, get out of the city. So my dad went around and he found there was one hospital that was run by Italian doctors and nurses who refused to leave because it was a women's hospital. And they had children and women in the ward, so they didn't want it to go. I was the first FGM case that was been admitted to that hospital. So they asked my dad to bring me in, and we went in, and they said, right, we're gonna give you, a, you're gonna have a scan. I have ultrasound, and they said, they could see a shadow. And they thought, okay, we think you have a cyst, but we'll keep you here for a couple of days, and then we'll repeat this scan and see if it's getting bigger. Three days after that, I had another scan. Now the cyst, the shadow that they could see on the screen was getting bigger. So they told my parents that I have to have an emergency operation. This time, the bombing outside and people were getting killed. So for me, I wasn't even thinking I was sick. I just wanted to survive. I just wanted not to get shot. That's all I was interested in. When, I, when they took me to the theater now, they realized once they opened my abdominal that it was my period. It was not a cyst. It was my period that was accumulating inside. There was nowhere to come out. But at the same time, the doctor had to come out and get permission from my parents to have the DV ablation operation. And my parents were like, yes, anything that to make her feel better, of course. I had that, came out. They kept me in the hospital because they can't do anything else but to wait for my next cycle. A Couple of weeks after that, no period. And that goes on for about three months. So now they didn't know what to do with me, but the war was getting really bad now, and we had to leave because part of the hospital was being bombed. Now, me and my dad have to try and get out of the city. And I remember my dad taking me to this small little plane while I still had the stitches, and just like bending over and just running to the airplane to get away. And 
and my dad was heard the army in Somalia, so just for his name as well, we were, we were in danger. When I, we end up in an island called Djibouti, where my mother is from, and again, I was a lucky girl because that same hospital that they had in Mogadishu, they had one in Djibouti as well. So I've been taken from the airport straight to the hospital. I stayed, I, when I went to that hospital, they operated me again because they knew the period with the blood was still accumulated, so they needed to operate me as soon as possible. I had the operation, wait for my next cycle, it never came. Then the doctor who operated me in Mogadishu operated me in Djibouti, so what she decided to do was to call a professor in, in Italy, in Milan, and that professor came to see me for 48 hours. He left Europe in his coat, nice little life and decided to come and help me. He looked at me, he took me to the theater, and he operated me and he said, let us wait for the next cycle. If that doesn't work, make sure she come to Italy to see me because we have better equipment there. Next cycle came, no period. It's still no period. So what they decided to do was while I was waiting for the fees and the ticket, it was about five months. So that five months, I was still in hospital. But what they were doing was they would put a small little tube, like a catheter, through my cervix, and that was hooked on a big machine like a hoover, big glass machine. And I used to lay there at the age of 13, 14, watching my period going through this tube and ending up in this big bottle. And that is how I was, how my period was coming up for five months. Now, FISA came through, we got the ticket, we went to Italy. Again, I was taken straight from the airport to the hospital. In Italy, I got there, went straight to the theater. I remember my dad told me my operation was from seven o'clock in the morning till eight o'clock in the evening. Um, then again, I have to wait for my next cycle. And after five years of being in hospital, in a war-torn country, traveled to another two different countries, at the age of 17, I started getting my period for the first time. So that was that. I was happy because for me, I got my period. I'm no more in pain. I'm OK. Yes, I have a lot of scars, but I survived the war. And that's all I used to think about. I traveled through Europe. I lived in Holland. I came to London, England 2001. And in 2002, I remember running upstairs in our house. And I just started bleeding for no reason. So at one point in my life, I just wanted to have my period. Now I'm bleeding for months, and it's not even stopping. I started going gynecologist and this is when we I used to live in Sheffield so this time we were in London I've seen this gynecologist and she told me the problems I have because of the operations I have a lot of adhesions and my period might go back to normal but it might not so I thought okay well I'll deal with it it's coming out now so I was just happy it was coming out now 2006 I got married to an amazing man who is not from my culture, he's from, born in London, but his parents are from Caribbean, know nothing about FGM. And I have to explain to him what happened to me, why have I got all these scars. But he was so supportive. We got married and we're trying to get pregnant. It's not happening. So I went back to the gynecologist and said, well, I need to know what's happening, you know? After all, about a year of his, in, investigation and everything, she said to me, Hoda, because what, you, what happened to you, because of the FGM, that is why I can't explain to you why you can't have a baby, but that is the only cause I can think of. So I would like to send you to, for, to have an IVF. I remember thinking, okay, so I kind of pushed it back, but then a year later I went for the IVF. She told me the air collection, after the air collection, I was at risk of getting perfect infection. So they give me antibiotics to cover that. 
I had the egg, egg transplant and the embryo transplant, and I got pregnant for the first time. So they, I have one embryo transplanted, and we have five more embryos left, and they put it in the freezer for us in the future. I got pregnant, but I miscarried a day before my first scan. After that, two weeks after, I got really, really sick. I got sick that I cannot explain. It was, for me, it was worse than anything I went through before. Because this time I had every tube you can think of. I have NG tube through my nose. I had central line. I had, I had it, was, it was horrible. And it was two weeks of being really, really sick. But what they did was, because I had a um, collection of fluid on my tube, so that got infected, but at the same time, they didn't want it to drain it because I have so much additions and scars in my stomach, the doctors were scared to, to do any procedure just in case it makes it worse. So what they did is just give me as much antibiotics as they were allowed to give me. And that made me sick as well. Um, but after that, I thought, hey, tomorrow is another day. Let me just get better. We have embryos frozen, and we can go for it again. When we got made the appointment three months after, my body healed and everything, we went for the transplant. So we got there, and we waited. So what they do, they take the embryos out, they wait for an hour, and then they transplant it. When they called me and my husband, I knew something was wrong because they never took me to the theater. I know because I had FGA and IVF before. They took us to our office, and I remember looking at him thinking, something is wrong. We got there, and the consultant sat down with us, and she said, I've been doing this job for 35 years, and I have never said this to any patient, but none of your embryos survived. So all the embryos basically died. And I thought, hmm, okay. Tomorrow is another day. We can go for another IVF. Then she said, I'm really sorry again. I have never said this to any patient harder, but you cannot have your own child. I was 31 years old. So I thought, okay, what's next? She said, well, you can have, get surrogacy or adopt a child. And I remember before I can answer my husband saying, my wife is not going to go through this. She's not going to die for a child that we don't have yet. Because the doctor said, if I go through and have another IVF, it can kill me. So at that moment, right there and then, we decided to adopt. Um, right now, we started the procedure of adopting. Uh, it's, it's hard. But it's great as well, because I know there are children out there who need a mother and who need a father. And I dedicate my life to those children, because I promise you one day I'll have the football team. I will. Um, in my professional life, I see women every day. I work in sexual health. And these women are traumatized. They are traumatized. They can't even say the word. They can't even open their legs. So we are all here today for a one cause. This is to help women and children from home. No human being should go through what we went through. My mother did it because she loved us. She was a victim. Her mother was a victim. My great-grandmother was a victim. But in my family, it is stopped with me. My nieces are not cut. My, all my nieces are not cut, and my family friends, girls are not cut. And in my family, me and my younger sister was the last one to, cut, to be cut. I'm 36 years old today, and I will keep on going until we are living a world free from FGM. So right now, all I'm going to ask you today is to go back to all your organizations and make sure is there a training in place. Because as professionals, it's when we know about things, when we know about a subject, it's only then we can help the other people. We have to be confident ourselves to pass the message, to help a girl like me, because it was doctors and nurses from Europe who saved me. This is why I'm in Europe today. So I am a lucky girl to be here, to be talking to you today. But please, let us educate the world, and let us help 
the patients that we see. Thank you very much.